Exciting news, the Planet Peterson store on Shopify is now open. Click the top link in the description to go to Shopify where you can check out shirts, stickers, digital artwork, and more. Thank you. So the reason why I'm about to make this particular argument, okay, is because earlier in the conversation, I heard you talking about probabilities. Now, there was one time that we began to have this discussion and we we actually got cut off. Like all lives went started going down on TikTok. Do you remember that night? No, that's happened to me several times, so. Okay, yeah, so I just wanna continue this, all right? So listen, let's say that we're gonna take any 12 English letters, all right? And I just picked a bunch of random ones right here. Okay. For every combination of these English letters that contains a meaning, like say this random sentence, each cupcake made me laugh, right? <laughs> there are over a hundred trillion ways of combining these same letters which do not convey a meaning. Now, the same thing happens to be true in the case of the DNA protein. So we're talking about nucleotides, we know that uh, obviously, these were arbitrarily labeled, right, by geneticists, right, G and C, A and T, we know that they pair together. But the point is that in the same way, this also happens to be a language, okay? So if we were going to take, say, a Hox gene or a homey domain of, say, just 60 amino acids long, okay, for every combination that makes a functional protein, there are 10 to the 33rd power of ways that do not, okay? And that's a 10 with, you know, 33 zeros behind it. So mm -hmm. the point becomes that given this math, it becomes highly unlikely that in the process of reproduction, a random search mutation, you know, the, the functions of Darwinian evolution will find things that produce the complexities we see versus ones that do not. So let me give you a solid example. All right, let me bring this to the fore a little bit. So for example, sponges do not have a nervous system, right? Sponges do not contain a nervous system. So what are the first animals to contain nervous systems? How did they get them? These are the types of evolution that we're talking about that must be true if really evolution as you propose it were to be true. I got a book on that for you, actually. Sure. Yeah, I'll check it out. So in a nutshell, what I'm saying is that when you were talking about probabilities, it uh, to me, it's just sort of problematic, man, because in one way, you're going to use it, I think, correctly. And you're going to be like, dude, the, the probability of such a thing being true is so low, right? It's like zilch, it's zero. But when we do the same type of reasoning to, to, to really discuss how evolution could produce the types of diversities that we see now all of a sudden the probabilities don't necessarily matter what's the so thing what i say is response? impossible pardon me what's the thing i say is impossible uh so basically the last or the second to last maybe it was the third guest had just made a proposition and you had basically said listen the probabilities of that being true is is really low Oh, and, that was the just, endogenous retrovirus thing. Yep. Yeah. So, and let's say that you're right. Let's say you're right. That's good reasoning. That's a good reason to be like, that is not the best explanation. And so I think in the same way, when we're talking about the chances of the known limits of evolution producing, say, things that have a nervous system when they didn't is so extremely low it's not the best explanation either. Um, okay, so I don't wanna talk about this. Um, what do you think the odds of like a group of human beings with Stone Age tools inventing the automobile is? Like a functioning automobile. Probably extremely low. Like basically zero, right? Sure. Um, but we do know that eventually human beings graduated from a more rudimentary system to a more complex system that was capable of producing automobiles, right? 
Yeah. So like the thing with the amino acids or whatever, um, and this is like slightly different, but I think it's kind of similar because it's like proposing, well, what are the odds that that particular amino acid uh, just kind of spontaneously evolves in, I don't know, in like a soup rich with the ingredients for it? Perhaps yeah. very low, but the first amino acids, well, it's actually proteins, amino acids build the proteins um, yeah, yeah the yeah, first yeah. proteins would have been way more simple which isn't as difficult but the other thing with this uh was there's like multiple things that analysis kind of says here are all the ones that don't work or here are all the thing here are all the combinations that aren't the combination of amino acids for the particular one we're looking at uh and then the one that that is right or like like if you have a lottery or if there's a raffle and they sell a million tickets, there's a there's 999,999 other tickets and then the one winner, right? Yeah. But uh, like with the raffle, uh, more than one ticket could have won, right? So with the with the uh, protein thing, it's like yes. Uh, what are the odds that this particular protein uh, shows up has this form? Perhaps very low. Does that mean life is statistically like? It's like absurd that it could have arisen naturally. Well, no, because that assumes that that's the only protein that could have that particular function, which we know you can change the amino acid sequence of a protein and it still maintains the same function. And it assumes that the the proteins we have today are the only kinds of proteins that could work for life. And I don't think there's really much of a good reason to say that that's the case. Um, a com parable analogy would be like if you flip a coin a hundred times in a row you'll get a particular sequence what are the odds of repeating the sequence that you did they're basically impossible but that doesn't mean that the sequence of flips you made was miraculous in in any way um there's probably a couple other things but i, I don't really remember at this point yeah okay so the first thing i want to say is that in your example, talking about, you know, early homo sapiens who, what are the chances they could build, you know, a functioning vehicle or car, computer, uh, something like that, right, being zero, your reasoning is definitely true. The issue, however, is that that's actually assuming that homo sapiens, as you understand them to exist, you know, being like Neanderthals, cavemen, etc., is true. So that's false because it's begging the question. I don't see it that way and numerous other scientists don't interpret it that way. The second what problem. that way. So uh, I, I'm just saying like your line of reasoning is true given uh, that cavemen were essentially cavemen, right? Uh, and I'm saying that I, I don't actually accept that premise. If it were true, your reasoning is valid, right? But I don't. And so that's begging the question because it's assuming something that I don't, I don't actually even think is true to begin with. The you second think we went problem, through a stone age? Uh, well, actually, I mean, it, if you phrase it as a stone age, maybe I'd be more inclined depending on what you mean. By, cave, uh, by cavemen, I didn't mean Neanderthals. I meant, I meant very old humans, archaic humans, homo okay. sapiens humans. Okay. Uh, well, that, uh, we can certainly discuss that particular point if you'd like, um, just in the way that I phrased it, which again, if we're going to sort of redefine it could be wrong. Um, but as I phrased it, it would sort of be begging the question from, uh, from my understanding. But the second thing that I would point out is that let's say that the second thing you said is also true. Let's say that, well, hey, we can change some of these arrangements. Uh, or, or rather, you could say there could be an arrangement that could still produce the same function in the past, right? Just a more primitive form, right? Let's say that's true. Um, I, didn't mean in the, I didn't mean in the past. I meant in the present. Oh, okay. Well, um, I, I think that sort of then becomes problematic then because then what are you talking about? Because if there are a set of arrangements of these amino acids, which produce a functioning protein, and there are an X amount of combinations that don't, then those are the ones that we're talking about. And my example still is that, valid. The, the, uh, I thought you said the that point was there's that more than one form could exist that we just don't know about. Right. The, the point was there's more than one, uh, combination of amino acids that will produce the same function uh that was one thing and then the other thing which is a separate argument is 
uh, you could have like completely different proteins that's that ultimately do the same thing. But it, there's also no reason to assume that the proteins we have are the only proteins that make life possible. So it's kind of yeah, three well, completely different things. Yeah. So I, I hope you understand, though, that even if, let's say, you rearrange mm -hmm. them and it does the same thing, that's still a functioning protein. So that still doesn't defeat my argument because my argument is actually saying, hey, you can combine them in ways that are functioning. And that's no problem. The issue is the, the vast number of ways that we know do not. So we're not talking about a rearrangement that can. We're talking about the number that doesn't because the, the search space is so vast, it becomes highly unlikely that a chance mutation process would find that than not. That's what I'm saying. What do you mean, right? We only have the ones we know about. It seemed like you were really proposing the mystery, right? There could be a primitive form we just don't know about, right? That could produce the same result that we can't, we don't, we don't see today, right? Because it's we're later down the time of evolution. So if that's the, not the, the primitive. Argument, the primitive form I was talking about was uh, the. I, I didn't say this, but it would be true that the you know a lot of the proteins that early life, for example, would have used may not be ones that are used anymore. That could be the case. But the, the bigger okay. point was that they would have been simpler than the ones today. Like the longest word in the world is Titan. And that's just an abbreviation of this uh, protein that we have in our muscles that gives them elasticity. And it's like 186,000 letters long or something like that. Uh, okay. That protein wasn't around uh, when life first uh arose in our planet it'd be it'd be dumb to think that it that it was but uh i think gradualism allows you to get to a very long protein like that okay uh well let me well i think that's uh, actually a, a good point and i'll tell you why in a second why i think that but uh first i just want to point out the last thing that i the reason I just don't see it the same way as you described it. And the, the reason why would be, I think you commit what's called a fallacy of a vending machine. So let's take your example of there being a, a million tickets and only one of them, uh, you know, is the, the winning lottery ticket. Okay. Probability does not change the more times an event is attempted. The probability remains the same. So for example, if you're flipping a coin and the chance is one in two, just because you flipped it and got heads one time doesn't mean you now will get tails the second. The probability remains the same, and such would be in your example. If the probability is one in a million, it doesn't matter if you attempted it 900,999 you know, times. The probability still remains one in a million. So I think this still promotes really why my argument I think is valid, that the best explanation would in fact be that it was not the product of something, uh, you know, chance based, uh, random mutation based, any Darwinian mechanism, but in fact was intentionally done by something we would call God. Now I want to clarify here, and this is why I think your first point was actually a good point. It could be that I'm wrong. That's, uh, of course it could, right? A chance mutation by chance could produce the functioning protein. That's correct. Like oh, it, wait, like we, know right. we know well, that. We know that that I'm just happens. saying it's highly unlikely. And that's why I think appealing to God actually makes the most sense. Um, well, that would just be an argument from incredulity. So in, in, in one way, yes, but not completely because I'm still basing that I off think... of the math. I, I think I think it actually is very much so because it's not just that you're saying like uh, we don't know how it would work with this particular mechanism, but the God hypothesis, there's also no explanation for how that even works. So even that's incredulable. Um, we we solve some sort of incredulity, incredulity with a placeholder that itself is incredulable. Is that a word? I don't know if that's actually. Yeah, no, I know what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, I would say that you do the same thing, though, when you appeal to, quote, simpler forms of life in the past. Uh, it's just the same thing. You're appealing to something you don't quite understand, but that could be an explanation of the evidence. The same thing is with God. Certainly, yeah. is there a level to God that is per, like appeals to incredulity in a way? Sure, it does, because I mean, God is in a way is 
outside of our ability to question, right? Or to test it, or, you know, to fill God in a test tube and measure it, right? Uh, however, it still follows from the reasoning that intentional creation is more likely than chance mutation given the improbability. Um, I don't think you could assess the probability of one of them, but I think you've also mischaracterized the other because it's not really chance. I mean, if you have a chemical system, it doesn't behave randomly, not really. Like there are some random aspects of it, like there's some Brownian motion that's going on um, and some other things. But like, you know, scient scientists are able to create autocatalytic reactions. Uh, prions, these protein, like, uh, I, I didn't even know this, but I knew prions existed. Those are like misfolded proteins in your brain. You can get them from eating other people's brains or Whoa. like mad cow disease. It's called Kuru in humans or Crutzfeldt Jakob syndrome or something like that. Um, but prions are misfolded proteins, but they actually replicate themselves, which is crazy. I didn't know that. So we have simple molecules that are, it, yes, they're detrimental to our form of life, but I mean, sorry, parasites, but parasites are successful, but these prions are randomly changed, mutated, and then they get folded in this unpredictable way, but it allows them to actually sort of be their own thing. I wouldn't call a prion alive, but it acts like something that's alive does in a, in a creepy sort of way. Yeah, so I, I do follow your line of reasoning, but I think it, I mean, it's, there's honestly a lot related to that. I guess the fundamental problem I would find is that it's a Lamarckian issue. So let's say that you did in fact, well, actually, no, let me appeal to this first. You remember when I took those straws and I threw them on the ground? Remember that live? And I said, what are the chances it spells a word? Do you remember that? Oh, yeah, I remember that in that live. Okay. Yeah, my, it, my phone died. Yeah, okay. Oh, you, oh, I thought all the lives got kicked. When I got off, I didn't see anyone else live. That's what I thought happened. But all right, so then remember, the other guy came on and yep. said, well, hey, wait a second, though. We're talking about living organisms. Yeah, there's a, so select, let, there's a, there's a selection bias, sort of. Yeah. Not even natural selection. It's just that the system, the chemical system, prefers certain things. And so it, it picks things. And that's what lets the system gradually build in complexity and it, and it appears yes. to like be doing something for a reason but it's just doing what it chemically prefers yeah 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 exactly so l starting with that as a point then well then okay let's take this back to your uh, to, to um to what you just said so if in fact it is alive in these changes through even again it may appear as a chance mutation but it maintains the functional proteins and passes them on and continues to build upon them. Let's take, let's take that then. Well, well then wait a second though. Is that an acquired characteristic? Is that an acquired characteristic? Because if it a is, a okay. Well, okay. because I didn't understand what you meant, but now I think I do. Can, yeah. Sorry. I didn't mean, I didn't mean to cut you off there. Um, no, I was just going to say that acquired characteristics cannot be passed on to their offspring. Um, there were experiments well, done in this by, again by a guy named Lamarck, and this includes yeah. even the fundamental basis of mutations. Absolutely, it does. So we'd first have to define whether, let's say it's true. Again, let's say it happened. Is it acquired? Because if it is, then you don't have a way to actually pass it on. Well, if it to happens in the the organism, yeah, I mean, offspring. well, a, a a bacteria, any change would be passed on because they they only have one chromosome, right? They only have one set of DNA, but bacteria do weird things too. But um, with animals, if a change occurs in the uh, germline cells, sperm or egg, then it will be passed on. And in a way that's acquired, but not in the, not in the sense that Lamarck thought. Uh, yeah. I, I have a really good book. I think it's called Lamarck's Revenge, actually, uh, that you would probably like. It's about epigenetics. Okay. Um, Good field. So we stuff like that, we're pretty sure has happened because we're pretty confident that mammals. So not all mammals have a placenta, 
we're pretty confident that the placenta arose from a, a viral infection in germ cells that actually changed the, the genes in a way that started developing the placenta. I think that may have happened with the amnion too, if memory serves me correctly. I could be wrong about that, but... Um, so weird things like that have happened, but they're extraordinarily rare, and nobody thinks that that's like what guides or really is responsible for speciation. Yeah, so I'm glad that you're actually aware of that because that's certainly important to uh, you know decipher whether that's valid or not. As if it would. I got to step away for five enough. seconds to let my cat out. Okay, do it up. Hey, what's up, chat? How you guys doing? While he's letting out his cat. What you... All right, she was staring at the door and then I opened it and she got scared. <laughs> Just go out, go in the living room. Go ahead. I, I, I love cats. Cats are great. There she goes. Okay. Not to hate on dogs, but cats are very clean and they're actually smart. Our cats walk with us, actually. They go for walks. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I like cats. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Uh, but... So, uh, okay, so so again, I'm, I'm glad that you actually know about that because I actually think that's key to this debate is if it is in fact related, you know, to whether it's acquired or not because um, that affects whether it can be passed on. But anyways, I think the best way to demonstrate that it in fact wouldn't be considered an acquired characteristic in that sense would just be to give a working example. So let's go back to the first thing I said. So what was the first animal to have a nervous system? Oh, um, I don't know. It probably would have resembled some sort of like flatworm sort of looking thing. You'd really like that. The book I told you about earlier, it's called Other Minds. It's actually written by a philosopher. And he, he talks a lot about uh, cephalopods like octopuses and cuttlefish to try to get an idea of like how complex animal minds developed. But he goes through like evolutionary history and he talks about how uh, a nervous system could have developed and what's really interesting so i can give you i can't tell you what the organism was but he lays out a, a really excellent case of how a nervous system could have developed so if you'll like if you're okay with me talking for like should be able to do it in about 90 seconds yeah i just looked up the book too let's hear it so like the idea is we know that even very very simple Unicellular organisms have photoreceptive spots on them, right? It's just some pigmented area that can be sensitive to photons, right? Okay. So with uh, something that's multicellular, you can have that too. Like you can have a patch of tissue, multiple cells that are like light sensitive, right? And uh, from that, it can either through like the, uh, like through the endocrine system or whatever, like the nervous system just communicates by sodium and potassium channels and calcium ions pushing material around and some neurotransmitters too. But anyways, it there could be some sort of like signal conducting through chemical communication between cells where like it could be an organism sitting in the water and on the top it has photoreceptive cells and it, it carries a signal into its body for whatever reason. Uh, we also know that organisms, simple organisms will, you know, scoot around on the ground right? That was actually a lot creepier. And this, this is actually super creepy looking. Anyways, they'll scoot <laughs> around on the ground and there's a, there's a desire to have some sort of tactile sensation, but it can literally just be like cells that respond to like pressure or touch or whatever. And uh, I don't remember a hundred percent the way he summarizes this in the book, but what it does is eventually those two systems actually merge because one is sending signals one way, one sending signals the other way. And when they, when the tissues that are involved with those kinds of things merge, then all of a sudden communication from multiple sensory areas connect. And that can be where a nervous system sort of begins to come from. Um, he has this other, man, I had this actually really well thought out. No, I don't remember it. But he had this like thing where um, he talked about like uh, animals reacting quickly there was this strong evolutionary pressure for that. And I see things, I have a fish tank. Have you ever had fish? You're muted. I didn't do it. I swear I didn't do it. It wasn't me. 
Oh, sorry about that. Yes, I have had fish. <laughs> have you ever noticed that the slightest bump, uh, like it doesn't even have to be on their tank, but like on the whatever table that their tank is sitting on will make them just instantly dart? So I want to say yes. I'm not sure if I've experienced it personally, but I think I've it's like it. if I could take my phone, I would go and show you. But it's crazy. I, I can literally just tap and they will instantly be able to respond to that because they're they're extremely twitchy like that. Um, this doesn't really have a lot to do with the nervous system, actually, like where it comes from. So we can just forget that basically. But I don't know if you thought that that thing I laid out makes sense or not. But I thought it was actually extremely intelligent the way he laid it out yeah so you know i guess the first thing that comes to my mind is that you know if he's a philosopher right was there any science to back this up or is it just like a thought experiment or, or i mean thought experiments can be based on scientific principles but that'd be the first thing i'm looking for if there are you know actually examples of that like he, has that he been, like, references tested? tons and tons and tons of studies in the book okay in that part of the book i don't remember off the top of my head uh, if he talked about it, I, I did a long time ago, there was a TikTok video I saw where they thought that they found compelling evidence that nervous systems actually evolved twice. Um, yeah. but I can't find that video and I don't remember if any of that, I don't rem I don't even know what the argument, what the evidence looked like. I, I okay. saved it for later and then I lost it. <laughs> no, that's fine. So I'm totally fine saying, of course that could be. Right. If it, if it lines up and, it, you know, it's been tested to say that this is certainly possible. Right. If nothing else, I have no problem saying that. However, I think in our present day, the problem still remains because what we have are animals that possess fully functioning nervous systems or they don't. We don't see any type of organism that contains a transitionary nervous system. Oh, I think right? we do. Uh, that's highly debatable because it's still a, uh, again, it's fully functioning, right? If we're well, talking but, about but the different functions changes that, that so, something can't be the way evolution works is there weren't animals in the past that had broken organ systems that didn't work. But if they just evolved a little bit more, they would actually start working. They're false. always that's fully not true. That's they're the always whole fully theory functional. behind how birds evolved. False. No, it's totally false. Yes, it is. And that's no. also how it, it's theorized for how things crawled out of the water. Absolutely it is, dude. You, I mean, look at Jurassic Park. It's absolutely a part of your belief system where you have some type of a land animal that's like half reptile, half bird. Absolutely. With wings that don't fully work. But that's it's 100 Well, the wings, theory. but the wings weren't for flight is the point. Like... Like, like you're right and I'm right, but it's because we're we we mean this in slightly different ways. Raptors didn't fly, except for probably was that micro raptor? Micro raptor could glide, um, but they had feathers and didn't use them for flight. But eventually they got co-opted to be used for flight. But what I'm talking about, what the hell? Or we we were talking about like the nervous system, whatever or whatever. Um, yeah. there are different nervous systems, and they all function because an organism, there's no such thing as a half evolved organism. Every, every organism that exists is is fully developed. They function. They just have different yep. functions, right? Exactly. It's like, for example, That's my point, man. That does not support some incremental change because no, it both does. work just the same. No, 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 it does. But, that, but, because... that's, a, but that's a leap, though, man. That's mm -mm. something that you must take yeah. purely based on your interpretation of the data. That, like, you, like again, even mm -mm. if you're right, you can't merge that with the data. That's just as much as a creationist or a theist interpreting the data in light of themselves. Uh, be, uh, again, because if it's fully functioning, as you also concede to, then where's the increment? I, where, I can tell you where the it? increment is. Organisms that are... So, like, if I say more primitive organisms, I don't mean... Like, I just got done saying every organism is fully, like, evolved, developed, or whatever. What I mean is organisms who represent phyla that are more ancient. Like flatworms, for example. Flatworms have been around... Uh, for many hundreds of millions of years, they are older than vertebrates, for example, according to like mainstream science or whatever. Um, they have eyes, 
but they're not as comp they don't have they're not as complex as ours they don't have the same kinds of functions and we see gradually like uh, insect eyes although like the compound eyes can be really crazy they have a lot of parts they're not as they're not really as complex or sophisticated or have as many functions as ours do and then like the nautilus has the pinhole camera type of eye but it's a mollusk mollusks mollusks are much more ancient than uh, like land animals are obviously. Um, and then, so we do see because we see, and eyes are just an extension of the nervous system because we see different types of like vision in the animal kingdom. And we, the organisms that are like the most quote unquote primitive or whatever have the, have eyes that are less complex. I think that actually very, very well supports, uh, evolution. Now there are some that are evolutionarily ancient like mollusks, but have actually complex and very good eyes. They have compound eyes like we do, but they work in a completely, well, not in a completely different way, but they work in a, in a very different way. For example, their lens doesn't change shape like ours does. They have a, yeah. they have a spherical lens and it just goes back and forth to focus the light. Yeah, and, their yeah, I read about those. and their retina isn't backward like ours is. Stupid retina. I hate you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So th it's funny that you're actually saying that because that's what I'm thinking of. But there's one thing I want to clarify first. So I understand when you're saying, listen, we're both right. We're, we're just saying something from a slightly different way. I'm glad you said that and you explained that because I see why, how you perceived what I said. So let me modify it slightly. And I'll start with a question. So are there any flatworms that don't contain a nervous system? I don't think so. Okay, so here's the problem. When we're taught, when I'm saying fully functioning, I'm talking about functioning as an able to meet the need that it's proposed for. So it, to try and reverse this and speak from your side, then this would be like saying, you know, a, a butter knife is more primitive to a bread knife uh, because one, you know, is sharper or something like, no, they both serve, they both cut but they serve different functions. That's exactly what you said. They serve different functions. So that's not a sign of just then an increment. I, I don't think that qualifies as an increment. And and let me also to be fair here, sorry, I don't just wanna go on, but there's a bunch of things I wanna tell you. Okay, so first, I can concede to you that there are some examples though that maybe don't work as much as in this way. Like for example, there's like this frog I've heard of that has like a pair of eyes that do nothing. And it's like, what could this possibly even be for? I think it was a frog or like, I've seen some examples that Is it a are, troglodyte? Does maybe. It, does it um, live in caves? Cause yes, that would yep. explain why. Oh, okay, well, yeah, it's better so, to conserve resources for some other organ. Yeah, no, that I totally understand that. What I'm trying to say though, is that I think from my perspective, those are harder to explain. So I can, concede that what I'm saying may not be uh, within like completely universal in interpretation. There are some things that I think are harder. Uh, however, that said, the basic principle I think remains the same. By fully functioning, I'm not saying, well, I guess rather, I guess I am. I'm saying that it's not an increment. There is no increment. If there was an increment, it wouldn't be fully functioning. That's like exactly the point. So if it functions, there, how did it happen? This goes back to my original oh, argument. Because it can you gain to function. explain how a chance mutation process could, in fact, produce, you know, through that vast search space of combinations of these amino acids and nucleotides, could somehow then, boom, now the flatworm has a fully functioning nervous system. Like, that's when the probabilities become so low. I think it's a problem. Um, now, last thing, let's I, also take your other example, though, about the fish. You say, well, well, hey, man, maybe it did happen quickly, was essentially what you were saying. Um, and I'm very aware of this. It's called punctuated equilibrium. That's the idea, that some things where we can't see the increments could have just happened quickly. Okay, totally fine. Again, I concede it could totally be possible, but that does... it. It's not the best explanation, though. Like, there's a huge leap of faith in there that is just as equivalent to a god of the gaps. Absolutely. Well, I, would, I wouldn't say that punctuated equilibrium is faith because Gould came up with that 
by by his reading of the fossil record. It wasn't that he said, hmm, maybe it actually works this way. And then he tried to make evidence fit that explanation. He came up with that idea from his interpretation of the evidence. Oh man, um, I just don't see that the same way, Peterson. Well, no, I, I don't want to get I, I don't want to get sidetracked on that because it's not super important. But there are other things I wrote down because they're um, I got to bring these up. So okay, um, something along the lines of like, uh, how did the the nervous system go from like, how did it gradually acquire its complexity, or how did it co opt new functions or something yeah, like that? Yeah, because we'll, we'll so always for example, ones that have them and those that yes. don't. We don't see okay. increments. Anything example, that has a nervous system fully works today. That that's kind of the case, although I would say we do have different nervous systems. But but anyways, so I don't know if I could give you an example for nervous systems, but we do know that scales and feathers, for example, which are completely different types of like, they're not yes. really tissue. I, well, they're they're tissue. No, I guess, no, in you're, a way. you're right. They come from a totally different combinations of of the amino acids. You're right. Yeah. No. No. But it, you can just they actually come from the same genes, the same gene. You can manipulate them uh, yes. really subtly and make scales grow feathers, right? So uh, gradually scales or like so some sorts of changes caused uh, feathers to arise from tissue that was originally growing scales. And so I think nervous system tissue can arise from tissues that were doing something kind of similar-ish but also w with a different function, ultimately. Like it could have been some sort of weird endocrine thing that just changed into a, a conducting pathway and we, and we have a nervous system or whatever. I, I don't, I couldn't make a very strong argument about where nervous systems come from, like histologically, but um, for example, a another thing that I think works is, um, Actually, quick question. Do you care if Simon comes on or? Yeah, I'd rather it just be us. That's fine. Um, we know that some animals have photoreceptors, but they don't use it for vision, right? Um, so for example, some, I actually kind of already talked about this, but some organisms have photoreceptive cells, but they don't use that to create uh, visions in their brain. They just use it to detect light. Uh, lots of amphibians and lots of reptiles and even some fish have a pineal eye, right? I, I, you know what that is? Yeah. Um, and octopuses are also very unique too. Yeah. So we have examples of tissues in the body that do something similar to, I, I mean, they, they're, they're photoreceptor or photosensitive, they're photoreceptors technically, which is what rods and cones are. Uh, your pineal gland actually does have rods and cones in it, I'm pretty sure. Or uh, or your pineal gland parietal eye, sorry. Um, which your pineal gland does have rods and cones in it, funny enough. Um, so I think that's an example where we have something that the parietal eye or whatever uh, is probably more primitive in a way the the earliest like the animals before they could see things probably had photosensitive cells that just detected uh changes in light intensity and that can have lots of different there can be huge numbers of reasons for that for example uv radiation causes we use it to sterilize things uh so organisms in the water if they're detecting high levels of uv radiation which is damaging to your dna they'd swim down to deeper waters and be protected, right? For most land-dwelling animals today, the only thing that really does is detect, uh, like, the, when the sun is rising and setting, so it helps with their circadian rhythms, right? Uh, yeah. and, the, and the idea that that could gradually change, I don't think is really too far-fetched. So I understand what you're saying, and it's certainly observable, like that classifies as evidence. Um, however, I would still point out that that's really not telling you anything about the origin of the structures, man. Just because these structures well, share evidence that it 
changes gradually, so why could it not have appeared gradually? It, well, here, well, let me explain why this is a leap in logic, okay? Just because these structures share somewhat simu- like similar molecular pathways you know, or patterns does not mean that they share a common ancestor or that they were produced in the way that you say. And, and honestly, I think there are huge differences between these um, appendages that I, I think you really haven't necessarily talked about. And I think it's like if zebra fishes have scales, there's no other reason than to think that they are scales, all right? If birds have feathers, then there's no reason than to say that what they were supposed to be, what they are now are feathers. I mean, dogs have fur. It was designed to be fur. Humans have hair. It's for hair. Like these structures are not changing into anything else. Mere similarity (laughs) of the patterning pathways, right, in the development does not imply some sort of common ancestry between the two structures. And again, if we come back to the biology, that's exactly what how it does. We, no, no, that's an interpretation of the data, dude. When it comes down to the data itself, again, you must imply your worldview upon but, it. It doesn't, it's not like necessitated. No. It's not 100% post hoc because, um, again, the, the, the idea that birds are the descendants of dinosaurs, that was Darwin's idea. That, that idea is extremely old. And he, he proposed that there would be fossil evidence that would conform with it. And to a lot of people, Archaeopteryx is extremely good evidence that conforms with it. Um, the prediction came before we found that. The idea about birds evolving from dinosaurs also uh, was before we even knew that uh, dinosaurs had feathers. That's really only since like the really early 90s been a thing that we knew. And the experiments about modifying scales to grow feathers, that, that was something we did in the modern age. And yeah, But Peterson, you're jumping in your logic, man. If dinosaurs had feathers, then there's no reason to think that they didn't serve a purpose but as feathers. Like it, you're, you're saying feathers that this Feathers have multiple major... purposes, though. Yeah, I, No, that's fine. They could have multiple purposes. Um, but there's no reason then to imply that something again that may contain a similar structure came from one or the other and again if we come down to the biology of how you say this happens you can just pick which one better fits the idea this is why i totally disagree about what you said about stephen gould's idea about punctuated equilibrium it was he dude he proposed it directly not because of what he found in the fossil record but because of what he didn't find peterson that's why he proposed these gaps were due to well, yeah, but that's still religion. looking at the evidence and coming yeah. up with an explanation. Like if uh, I go to yes. if I go to Africa it, and I is, and I find no penguins, right. I'll say point. penguins don't live in Africa. I'm, I'm missing it. Say it again. I said if I go to Africa and I find no penguins, I'll say penguins don't live in Africa. Actually, I think there are some penguins that <laughs> that actually yeah. go to Africa. No, okay, okay, all right. But that so that's a data that's a data driven conclusion. And he looked Dude. at the fossil data and he said, "Oh my god, it's not uh, it's not as gradual as maybe people think. It's more of a punctuated." Thing. Oh, okay. So tell me, is it also reasonable to say that they share common structures because they were made by a common designer? Is it, is it is it reasonable to say the homologous structures are a sign of a homologous creator? Is that reasonable? It's it's not like logically absurd or anything. It can be logically consistent, but it doesn't it doesn't make it doesn't make you're any predictions and it doesn't thing. have any you're testability. Doing the exact same, but from the opposite point. Like you're like, dude, he's just looking at the data. He didn't see fossils, so he said punctuated equilibrium. How freaking convenient, Peterson. That it, when the evidence is there, you just cite it. But when it's not there, you just make up a theory to explain why it's not there. And oh, it's just you're following the data. <laughs> like it's that's no how different, dude. But that's precisely what we do a lot of the times. We, we When we try to solve murders, we rule out suspects based on the data. This data is, con, is uh, consistent with the idea that these things didn't happen. Yeah, I, I follow your line of reasoning. I'm just saying that doesn't therefore make it true. So it's convenient that you're able to appeal to any narrative, which are very different, to fit the whole general idea. You're just like... But my ideas are consistent. ...fit the narrative, right? And you're saying, look, it fits. Yeah, great. But you still had to. Yeah, but they all fit. 
they, they all fit very well. The fossil record, the the Has fossil record and gaps, genetics and so many anomalies, tons of problems. The the mainstream idea on the fossils is ridiculous, man. Ridiculous. You mean? talk about Archaeopteryx. There's like less than ten of those ever found. So in, in fact, it only, some of it them only takes one. Plagiarized. There's a guy in China who made a ton of money faking one of them. It's possible. True. Happened. Look it up. <laughs> okay. Like there, there's so much shady business in fossils. You find thousands of dead animals in the ground. What the fuck is this, this elephant thing? I've never <laughs> seen that before. <laughs> what? <laughs> That was sorry. I've never seen no, that before. No, fine. I'm I, I, I'm glad you weren't laughing at what I said. It was the elephant. No, um, I'm just saying. You like to me. Ahead. There's so many other interpretations of the data that to me make far more sense. And this is exactly what I was saying with my probability argument, is that when you're weighing these ideas, even if both are possible, that doesn't mean each is more or likely to be possible. And so I think, given again the vast anomalies and issues and ideas with coming up with how a change like the nervous system could have happened is best explained by a designer. That's my position. <laughs> but what can the designer actually explain that isn't well, like can, post hoc? What, so, well, I mean, I'm sorry you feel that way, but there's many things it can explain. So for one, I just told you that it can explain homologous structures. Uh, also, it can explain how even in genetics, but, any information exists so at all. I, a I asked is, a very dumb question, apparently. So like you can claim it, but what validation does it, What what's your method for validating it? So, uh, I mean, there's because if the only method different... is saying that, well, there are problems with what you believe in, like your hypothesis does not become more correct when mine fails to account for specific things. That's true. I, I, I'm actually sort of confused as, as to why, like you're asking it. My point is that if you can show based on probabilities of an event being far less likely, sure, that doesn't mean therefore my option must have taken place. It just means it's the most reasonable. That's all that I'm saying. But on what grounds is it more reasonable? Dude, why are you asking that based on the mathematical probabilities? Again, the same but, thing but, as the but English yours language is but there's true no... of, the, of, of genetic information. There are only so many combinations which create functional proteins, okay, that build up all the f functions we're talking about, like a nervous system. Yeah, okay? we went, we went like over the, that. The chances but... of this coming about through the means of Darwinian evolution, to be specific, is not the best explanation. It's highly more likely. What? That, how? Then how does it's... creation work and why is it more likely? Because I could just say the odds that the creator created the amino acid sequence in the perfect order required for it to actually function is the same so because it's, it's, it's this it's the same number of proteins and it's the same amino acid sequence the odds that your creator put those things together just right is the same so you're not really wrong like oh thank you if you just boil that down to simplicity no you're you're of course you're right and i thought i actually conceded earlier that when you're appealing to god it does pose many other questions right and that's why they call it the God of the gaps. I, I fully understand. So in that sense, you're not really wrong. However, that basis alone doesn't therefore follow that my position is less reasonable than yours. No, it absolutely is still more reasonable that this is how it happened. Does but, it propose? But we questions? haven't sure got to the point where we've decided what made it more reasonable. Like if I said, what are the odds that I win the 100 meter dash at the Olympics next year or uh, Noah Lyle, Lyles? I can't remember what his last name is. Uh, what's more likely, me or him? Well, it, it's very, if we look at just me, we can come up with a ton of reasons why it's very unlikely. Although in high school, my PR was about 11.2. Today, I can't run anywhere <laughs> close to that fast. I have no idea how fast I can run. Um, now, if we were just looking at that, we wouldn't be able to say how likely it is that something 
like this other particular, like if I just said, uh, Schmitty uh, Warbin Jaegerman Jensen will win. Well, it's more likely that Schmitty Warbin Jaegerman Jensen will win. Okay, but how fast is Schmitty? Well, you're not fast enough to win. Yeah, but how fast is Schmitty? Yeah, see, the thing is, you're not, you're not very fast. We're not, you're not telling me about Schmitty. And the problem that's going on here is Schmitty was number one. So that, uh, that's, that's a good <laughs> argument for why. Not. But the problem is like with the creation thing, like, okay, so naturalism, how could it have gotten things exactly right? Maybe it couldn't have. Therefore, creation is better. Why? How does creation work? Well, yeah, naturalism just saying. fails. You're not telling me anything about the alternative idea. So, I mean, I com- I totally can tell you about uh, all you want to know about the idea, but there's a few things that I I just want to propose, though. Okay, number one is that I've been clear at when everything that you said that I think is observable, it's true, it's science, and where you're merely applying an interpretation. Okay, I've been very clear, and that's not an accident. I'm using that word on purpose because... Really, Peterson, we have the same data, the exact same data. I don't have some special earth because I'm a creationist. I have the same exact one, the same dirt, the same air, the same water, right? So that's why the interpretation, I think, becomes key because it can be explained different ways. And that's why I pointed out that, dude, you can just choose which one you want, whether it's you know, it happened fast and punctuated equilibrium, or it happened as it's traditionally thought over millions of years. You can just pick which one you want to fill that gap. Now, to your point about, well, hey, just because you point out this is improbable doesn't mean you said how probable yours is. Now, you're technically right. So what I will do is I'll merely characterize it as a deductive argument. Ready? So the explanation for a nervous system, like we've talked about, is either because of Darwinian evolution or it's because of a creator. By characterizing only these two as an option, I can then do something which is reverse that probability, Peterson. So if the probability of evolution being the source of how these mutations took place is one in a million, well, then I can just say the probability that God did it is a million to one. (laughs) <laughs> you're not i can i can hear everything you're i can hear everything you're saying don't worry it's hard for me to listen with that purring noise okay it's very cute sorry but i had to what that was very what's rude. his name i don't know it's a it's a girl the the adoption agency her name was latte and i'm like i don't like that name uh <laughs> some of the proposed ones that i like are stella and uh i like i like luna i think luna is a cool name Luna's cool after the moon. She is yeah. white. No, that's not a very graceful. Anyways, do you want to keep going with your uh, your thing or? Well, I just don't know if you if you heard me. So listen, if I shape it as a deductive argument, it was either God or it was evolution as you understand it. Those are the only two options. Then what I can do is reverse the probability and answer your objection, which would be. If the probability of it happening through evolution is one in one billion, then if the only other option is God, then the probability that God did it is one billion to one. So for your objection to be valid at this point, Peterson, I think you would have to present a third possibility. So if it wasn't evolution and it wasn't God, then what was it? And if you can't come up with anything, then you must concede that in fact, I can correctly reverse those probabilities, right? It's way more likely God did it. A billion to one doesn't mean that the odds are... So if I say something is... The odds of something happening are one in ten, and you say, well, the odds of mine are ten and one, that doesn't mean that yours happens nine times out of ten and mine happens one time out of ten. Yeah, that's that's correct. But we can still... Like, that's still possible. You can reverse a probability to talk about the likelihood of something happening. In fact, you could technically just break the math down and create it sort of fractional and it would say the same thing. It wouldn't matter. Um, so the, it's still, we need, still, we need still somebody valid, who's though. smarter on numbers for that. Cause I don't, I don't really, I don't think that that's right, but I'm yeah, not going to Absolutely. You. That's done all the time. 
no, all the time. I mean, I mean, yeah, the, you, the you've part, never heard someone about say the say... chances of something happening is like a thousand to one. You've never heard that before. No, I've I've obviously heard that before. I'm talking about the thing yeah, where so you then said that's, that's if I reverse it, mine becomes more likely, and you must concede. I don't think that makes any sense, but um, I well, don't. Well, know, obviously, like, we're limited to just what we're talking about, not in the grand scheme. I'm saying on this topic, right? We're talking about the probability of something like a nervous system, right? Yeah. So if I'm saying, hey, I think he, based on the math of amino acids. The chances of it not happening are 10 to the 33rd power. I showed you the number. Okay. And the only other option is God. Then that's how God becomes more likely. And so you're saying, well, wait a second. Yeah, I don't. I you don't, have to I show why you're more likely. you got likely. numbers for well, that's God. that's what I'm saying. I don't. That's under, my point. Where did it you would get. Have to, but where did you get numbers for God? Again, I think, I think somehow what's happened here is you've. You've said yours has become more likely because of how unlikely mine is without a method Correct. of how to actually calculate yours. No, it's the same thing. By calculating yours, I am calculating mine. That's that's the whole point, man. Well, I told you we have the Don't same earth, the same amino acid. Works. Yes, it is, man. Because, well, well, again, and if it's not, so. then what you have to do is demonstrate anything else it could have been other than God. A creator, an intentional. Well, it could mind. have been any kind of god, or or several of them. That's fine. That's totally fine. But that's still in favor of my position, though. Again, you're that's acting in favor like it's of unreasonable. Any position is the problem. No. So uh, I think that what you're doing is just not thinking it through. If we ha if mm. we're attesting the probabilities of amino acids, right, and we're and we're saying, hey, what are all the combinations that don't do anything? Or even if they're harmful, that's a whole other set, like like harmful mutations. What are the probabilities of this? Then we can conclude that if it wasn't by chance, it must have been on purpose. This and that's what we call God. Like that follows re, it falls naturally. Well, I don't that's think it happened by conclusion. chance, but I don't think it happened teleologically. I think it happened because uh, chemistry has to obey certain rules or whatever. I feel like well, we're kind of stuck at this point, and we have been talking for 57 minutes and 11 seconds. So okay. you want to just pick this up some other time?